have a Bible, I would invite you to go ahead and turn to Ephesians chapter 2. If you don't have a Bible and you have a smartphone uh, and you have a Bible app, then you can go ahead and turn to that. I wondered if we were going to turn lights on or not. That way you can actually see who is sitting next to you. And if you're not really crazy about the person that's sitting next to you, you've got the whole service to find somebody else to sit next to, okay? Um, however, that, however that goes. I, I promise I'm not going to get uh, overly um, emotional about this, but I've got to be honest with you, this is a big deal for me that we are celebrating five years as a crosswalk. Um, I've made the statement to a couple of people, thank you, and I don't think some of you believe me when I tell you that five years ago there were a lot of people telling us we would never last that as a church, we, we just weren't going to cut it. You know, we've been called a lot of things. Uh, some of them nice, and a few not so nice. And um, it, it's just been incredible to see how God has brought, for instance, you're here today. Could you believe that? I mean, five years ago, would you have believed that you would be here today? Some of you know. And so we're just so incredibly grateful. Um, I just thought I would point out a couple of what I would call high points of the past five years. And uh, it starts with the fact that we as a people have stayed true to the vision of being a church for broken people. We aren't trying to be everything for everybody. We're not trying to have all the answers. We just want to be here for the people like us who need somebody to listen to and somebody to share the truth with them. Uh, I also, one of the high points for me is the fact that we are a family. And this all started, for those of you that know anything about our beginnings, we couldn't find a place to have church on Sunday morning. So we started off meeting in uh, the Baptist Association's uh, gymnasium uh, out on Highway 47, and uh, we, would, we would have a meal every Sunday night. And that's how we knew that we had such incredible cooks in this church, and so thank you for that. And we were there for over two years, and that's a lot of meals, a lot of Sunday night meals. Uh, but it, it built our fellowship, it built our friendships, and it continues to this day. I don't know if you smelled it when you walked in today, but there's pork steaks back there. And some of them grilled as recently as this morning. So um, we're just thrilled that we're going to get to share that with you. Uh, another thing that really stands out to me is the incredible generosity of the people in this church. Just existing. There are a lot of churches closing their doors these days, especially small churches. And God has blessed us with you because you continue to give to us. Uh, you've, some of you that are new notice we didn't pass around a, a bucket or a bag or anything like that. No, we have joy boxes that we put in the back of the room. And if you feel that God has blessed you to give, then you put something in there. If not, then uh, that's not why you're here. We think God's got something for you today. Uh, another uh, thing about that is our Easter project, which is uh, we are teaming up once again with Sleep in Heavenly Peace. And for those of you that don't have a clue what I just said, Sleep in Heavenly Peace is an organization that is determined to make beds for the kids in a community that don't have a bed. And some of you are going, well, I can't believe there's kids in this community that don't have beds. Then you don't know our community. Um, we have already, was over 150 We've delivered 173 beds so far, and you've got that many more waiting. Yeah, and so uh, our people here are, are just really, really into that, and we're going to be giving even more at Easter so that we can do more beds. Uh, but all of that points to this congregation being willing to go beyond. We're willing to go beyond what other people are doing. We're willing to do what no one else is doing. We're willing to talk to the people nobody wants to talk to, and we're willing to help when other people have said it's not going to make a difference. Uh, and that adds into the number of volunteers that we have. Um, and for some of us, we're just we're sitting in this room, and this room is a testimony to what God did because we aren't still out in that gymnasium. You notice you're not out there this morning? Okay, all right. Um, we moved into this building almost two years ago, and uh, some of that has to do with embracing change. 
but if you had seen this room before we started on it, you would be amazed because this was an insurance office. In fact, if you make this trip long enough, it will still show up on your phone as Steamboat Insurance. You know how Google does that for you? You know, for some reason they can't kick that, them out, but this was all insurance offices. And uh, our people came in and did a fantastic job of putting it all together. And we are so blessed with this. And then I would just say that uh, this is an incredibly loving place. And I think that's what it takes today to be the church that God wants us to be. All right, so I'm done with that. Now, I want you to turn to the person next to you, and I want you to tell them um, how your week went. Just go ahead right now. Turn to the person. Well, here, let me give you a little zero to ten. Zero to ten. Zero meaning it didn't. Ten meaning it was absolutely fantastic. How did your week go? How was your week? <laughs> okay, I had a really good week. Thank you for asking. Okay, good. Um, but I want us to talk now about the kind of week. I want to go beyond that. I want to talk about what kind of life we should actually expect to have. Today's message is, is very basic. So I want to start with two of the most foundational truths that I know of. And uh, here's number one, there is a God. Isn't that good? There is a God, I'm glad that there is because uh, people will argue about that. And then here's the second foundational truth. Number two, it's not you. <laughs> I know that's a rude awakening for some people, but there is a God and it is not you. Now you're laughing, but let me just say this. That means that your life is not your project. It's God's project. Your life was his idea. And knowing this is gonna be very important for us in the weeks to come as we keep talking about this. Uh, but this comes from Ephesians chapter two, verse 10. And here's what it says. It says, for we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Incredible. We are not our own workmanship. Only God knows what we are fully intended to be or to look like or to participate in. Only God knows what the potential is. Now, every once in a while, we do a good thing, right? Even you, right? You do a good thing, okay? When that happens, we get a glimpse of who God made us to be. Maybe we say something that inspires somebody else. Maybe we help a homeless person that nobody else even notices. Maybe we're patient with a three-year-old. Pretty amazing, I know. Maybe we get lost in the wonder and beauty of a piece of music. Maybe we fall in love. Maybe we have an idea. It still happens, doesn't it? Once in a blue moon, we have an idea. Maybe we express compassion to somebody. Maybe we stand up to that bully that nobody else will stand up to. Maybe we make a sacrificial gift. Maybe we fix something. Maybe we forgive an old hurt. Maybe we say something that we normally would never say, and it turns out to be just the right thing that needed to be said. Maybe we keep from saying something that we normally never keep from saying, and it turns out to be just the right thing not to say. Yeah. When any of that happens, we're getting a glimpse, we're getting a picture of who God made us to be, of the way that God made us up. Because what God wants to do is help each one of us to reach our full potential. God intends for you and me to become the best version of ourselves that we could be. And it's not gonna look like anybody else. And it's gonna be wonderful. Listen, God is more concerned with us reaching our full potential than we are, all right? He is guiding this process all the time and he has many, many, many tools at his disposal. And here's the part that's frustrating for us. 
God is not in a hurry. Don't you wish God would hurry up with some people? You look at them and you go, oh my goodness, I wish God would hurry up and get done with that person. That's frustrating for us. But God is very patient. Now, Jesus made some staggering promises about his ability to change human lives into the kind of life that he wants. We're going to be in John chapter 7, if you want to go ahead and turn to that. John chapter 7. There is a feast going on in Jerusalem, as we're going to start reading this in just a moment. By the way, there were three big feasts, total six feasts in the year, but three of them were really big feasts. That meant every Jew that lived within a certain distance was expected to come back to Jerusalem for these feasts. And one of these feasts was called the Feast of Tabernacles. And really, that would be a little bit like our Thanksgiving. And this is where they would thank God for his goodness, for the abundance that he put into their lives, for everything that he provided for them. Sounds a lot like Thanksgiving time, doesn't it? At least what Thanksgiving should be. But a highlight of that feast, at the very end of the feast every year, is that a priest would go to the Pool of Siloam and they would draw out water, and it would be in a gold pitcher. I can't imagine a a, a fully gold pitcher. And they would take that water, and then they would lead a procession back towards the temple. Now, the water that came into Jerusalem was very precious. It came in through an aqueduct. There were no wells. There there was no river that went through Jerusalem. Um, So this was very precious stuff. But listen, as they went back towards the temple, it became this hooting and holler and parade. The people were so filled with joy. There was so much shouting and so much praise that the, the rabbis used to say this. They would say, the one who does not know the joy of tabernacles does not know joy. It was that big of a deal. And the priest would lead them all the way to the temple mount. And then the priest would shout with joy. You will draw water from the wells of salvation. And so everybody would squeeze into the temple area. If you remember, that was a big area at that time. And they would would do something that was really unusual at that point. They would then pour that water out on dry ground. Now, again, these were desert people. They did not waste water as a rule. But this was a reminder to them every year that they served a God who one day brought water out of a rock for his people. And everyone would cheer as that water was being poured out. Every, everybody was looking forward to the day when God would send them the Messiah. And so this was just one more picture of that, that God was going to provide for them. And what's really cool with the scripture we're going to read is that what we're going to read about happened on that day. Maybe at that very moment, When all the crowd was gathered, and we pick this up in John chapter 7, verse 37, and it says, On the last and greatest day of the feast, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice. So imagine that big crowd up there on the top of the mountain, and Jesus is standing up in some place where everybody can see him, and he says, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. They had just watched that poured out. And now Jesus is going, hey, anybody here thirsty? We'll explain what that really meant in just a moment. He says, if you are, then I want you to come because I can give you something to drink. To be thirsty in this sense meant to be discontent. It meant that you were not happy about something, that you had unsatisfied longings. Does that uh, sound like us just a little bit? Unsatisfied longings? Maybe you just had a bad week. And Jesus was saying, hey, all of you dissatisfied people, all of you gripers and whiners. Do we have any gripers and whiners in the room today? Yeah, you better be careful. God could send a lightning bolt. Boom, you know, take you out. So we would be one of those people, okay? And Jesus says, hey, all of you, I want you to come to me. He says, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He doesn't say, and then you're going to be satisfied. He doesn't say, and then you'll have enough to drink. He goes on in verse 38, and here's what he says. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow 
from within him. You got that picture in your head? Streams of living water. If you read from an old King James Bible, it says that from your belly will flow streams of living water. Water that is alive. Verse 39, it says, by this he meant the spirit whom those who believed in him were later to receive. He says, hey, everybody who's thirsty, everybody who has unsatisfied desires, I want you to come to me. Because not only are you going to be satisfied, but you can become a source of life for other people. When it talks about that belly in, in uh, the book, in, in the King James version of it, uh, the belly in that sense is the place way down deep inside of us that we would call our core. Have you ever noticed, especially if you're into exercise, there's always somebody who wants to talk to you about your core, right? Yeah, and uh, some of us get that speech a little more often than others. You know, that we have a weak core. Um, and, uh, oh, there's so many things I want to say about that, but I don't have time to do that. But Jesus is talking about core in a different way. He's referring to that place deep down inside of us that sometimes feels empty. It's that place that feels hollow in the middle of the night. It's the place where the butterflies fly. We've all had that. But Jesus is saying, he says, watch this, out of your belly, out of your core is gonna flow energy and hope and joy and strength without us having to manufacture it, without us having to fake it. And he says, come to me. A little later in John chapter 10, he kind of paints the same picture, but it's, it's a little different. The reality is the same, but the picture is just a little bit different. Here, Jesus is talking about his people. He's talking about his sheep and his desire for them to have life. And look what he says in John 10, verse 10. He says, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. But look what he says about himself. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Life is such a great word for salvation. Such a great, I that, that idea of being saved means to be alive. And then the part that I would call super salvation is when he says they can have it to the full. Life with abundance running out your ears. So much stuff that you don't know what to do with it. God's plan for you is that you become the best version of yourself. We would call that a new identity. Right now, there are two versions of you. There is the you that God made you to be, and uh, there is the you that currently exists. You understand what I'm talking about? Yeah, here's the you that God, this is what God wants to see, the promised you, and then there's the you that most of us realize is just, that's reality, right? How many of you would agree with me that there is a gap between the you God made you to be and the, get the you that you really are? There's a gap, right? And, and the problem is, is that we think we have to close that gap. We think we have to come up with a solution. Many people think that they can close that gap by simply trying harder. I, I'm gonna give it my best. Some people beat themselves up thinking they're not being heroic enough in their spiritual life. You know, maybe if I read my Bible more, maybe if I went to church more often, maybe if I would give more in the offering, maybe if I would serve more people, maybe if I would work harder, maybe if I would be nicer to people, which some of you could do, you know, that wouldn't be so much of a stretch. But let me tell you what happens. We hear about somebody and, you know, come to find out, they get up at 4 a.m. every morning to pray. And we feel guilty because we don't think we pray enough. And then here's this person gets up at 4 a.m. to pray, so we decide, you know what, I'm going to do that too. Even though we may not be morning people, even though at 4 a.m. we are dazed and confused and grumpy and groggy, and no one wants to be around us at 4 a.m. Even Jesus doesn't want to be around you at 4 a.m. Okay? 
But, you know, we just kind of go with that. We think, you know what? It's hard, it's exhausting, and it's miserable, and I don't like doing it, so it must be spiritual, right? Absolutely. It, it must be good for me. So we try it. A lot of times we try to do these things at the beginning of a year. Uh, we'll do it for a few days. If we're strong, we'll do it for a few weeks, maybe even a few months, but not forever. And eventually we stop, and then we feel guilty because we stopped. So when the guilt gets high enough, we start doing something else, and we start this cycle all over again. We feel guilty, we start something new, it doesn't work, we get tired, we stop doing it, and the guilt just keeps building. And our secret is, we think, because we know we're getting tired, but we think um, if we just keep doing this, maybe we can ignore some of this and just it, everything will fix itself. I got news for you. It's not just that we're getting physically tired, it's that our souls are getting tired. And again, we think if we could just deny it, if we could just pretend that it's not really a problem. By the way, what helps there is not going to church, okay? If you go to church, you're gonna feel guilty because you're not doing the things you think you should do. So then you stop going to church and so that, boy, you're a tough crowd. I usually get a response like, right, pastor? Huh? Going to church, right? Yeah. So maybe if we just rededicate ourselves, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to, yeah, or we spitch, spitch, it's not a word, okay, or we switch to another spiritual tradition, or we go to another church, maybe if we just secretly give up, we'll just hope that when we get to heaven, we're going to get in, okay, that's what we're going to hope for, so here's the question and I really encourage you to come back over the next several weeks. But here's the question we're going to be dealing with for the next few weeks. What if Jesus was right? What if he meant what he said about there being rivers of living water available? And they really could flow from inside of us. What if such a life was possible for you and me? We don't get there by trying harder. It's not going to do you any good to feel guilty. So what if? What if Jesus was right? Let me show you a couple more verses from Scripture that I think will show us who is actually supposed to be doing this work. Look at these with me. Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. Philippians 1, 6 says, Being confident of this, that he, doesn't say me, he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. He says, listen, I want you to understand that until Jesus comes back, the work that God started in you, God is going to complete that work. Then we go to Philippians chapter 2, verse 12. He says, therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, Continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. And we go right into verse 13. For it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. Does that sound like it's all on your shoulders? No. Then we look in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17. It says, Now the Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is there is slavery. There is a big to-do list, right? It's not what it says. It says there is what? Freedom. Now, look at verse 18. This is cool. And we who with veiled faces I need to type better. It is unveiled faces. Do you have any idea where that picture comes from? Because I wasn't planning to do this, but now that I've made a fool of myself, I better explain it. Um, Moses, when he came back down from the mountain, from getting the Ten Commandments, he spent all that time up there with God, and God gives him the Ten Commandments, but because he'd spent so much time in God's presence, when he came down from the mountain, his face was literally glowing from having been in the glory of God. And the people were so scared of him, they didn't want to come near to him. So Moses would put a veil over his face to keep the people 
from being so scared. Incredible, isn't it? And so that should add more to this, and I should have... (laughs) We who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory, we are being transformed. We would use the word changed. We're being changed into his likeness with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord who is the spirit. All those verses to say this, God is the one who's doing this work. Not you, not me. You can't try harder. It's not going to make a difference. But here's what happens to a lot of people. When we first come to God, when we first believe, we realize, I got a problem. There's a gap. Here is this holy, perfect God, and here's me. And I am, as I am right now, there is a big gap between God and me, and it's a gap of sin. Question, can I bridge that gap through my own effort? Take a wild guess. You got a 50-50 chance on this because it's a yes or no. Okay, no. I cannot bridge that gap by human effort. Only God can bridge that gap. And what does God give us to bridge that gap? Favorite word around here, grace. Grace. So the only way for us to get from where we are to where we need to be is grace. And God gave us that through Jesus Christ. And many of us here have received grace that gift. And if you haven't, I sure hope that you'll do it today. I really do. But here's what often happens. We become Christians, okay? But we realize there's still a gap. Now the gap is between the me that God wants me to be and the me that currently exists. That's the gap between the life God promises and the life that I'm living right now. And again, that gap is sin. Can we bridge that gap through human effort? You know, hey, I guess I'm just going to have to get from here to there on my own. No, we can't do it without grace. So we are invited to live by grace. We call that life change around here. We call it going beyond around here. Becoming a new person. It happens only through grace because what God does, he only does through grace. When we first come to God, we experience grace primarily as forgiveness, okay? When you first come to God, that's what you feel. That burden that, you, that is lifted off of you, it's that sin that you were carrying around. And God gives you grace by forgiving your sins. But grace is so much more than that. God was a gracious God before anybody ever sinned. Creation itself is an act of grace. What does the word grace actually mean? Free gift. It's a free gift. God's plan for you and me is to live every day in this grace. He wants us to learn how to operate, how to run our lives on this grace. He wants us to wake up in grace. He wants us to receive life and energy as a gift from him. Grace is something that we need because we sin, okay? But grace is also what we are intended to live on all of the time. Grace is the generosity of God. And once we become Christians, we will experience grace primarily as power. Oh, be careful, Mabel. I don't know where he's going with this one. Power to do what otherwise you and I couldn't do on our own. The picture Jesus uses for this life in the spirit is a picture of a river. He said, streams of living water. So if you're taking notes, that'd be a good one to put down. Grace equals a river. And it's already told us, Jesus is talking about the spirit. He's talking about the Holy Spirit. Now, the idea of a river is used over 150 times in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Most often, it is used as an image of spiritual life and grace. And there's a good reason for that. I've already alluded to some of this. But Israel was a desert country. And these were desert people. I cannot honestly imagine living in a desert. It's just beyond me. Plus, these people did not have our technology. Can you imagine going home at night and not having air conditioning? 
not having a cold drink, you know, it's, it's, um, and so literally for those, these people, if rains did not come, people were going to die. And it's so hard for us to imagine. I've already told you Israel did not have any rivers. It had the Jordan River, which was its eastern boundary. But in Israel itself, they had something called wadis. It's spelled W-A-D-I-S, wadis. You remember that from high school geography class? No. I don't know who your teachers were, but no, we won't go there. These were like dry gulches. And so when the rain would come, these wadis would fill up. So a river was grace to these people. A river was something to be really excited about. It was a gift. It was life. Now, we don't know a whole lot about the Garden of Eden, but we do know that a river ran through it. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 10, it tells us how life through the river. This is back at the beginning of your Bible. It says, a river watering the garden flowed from Eden. And the Israelites would read that, and they would think, man, what a good God we have. He would send water. Psalm 46, verse 4, is basically a dream that's written down. And here's what it says. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God. Oh, what I like that picture. We're going to take that even further here in just a moment. But that's life. Because when the river flows, life will thrive. When the river dries up, life will die. We are not our own workmanship. Look at this expression of longing in Psalm 42, verse 1. I think you've all heard this. It says, as the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, O God. Now, when I grew up, my picture of this, I, was, I would imagine Bambi going around this really green forest looking for a little stream to get a drink from. That's kind of what I grew up with, okay? But that is not the picture. Where are these people? In a desert. All the wadis have dried up. If this animal doesn't find water, it will die. That's a picture of desperation. The psalmist is telling us, just the human condition, people. You and I were made to function on and run on God. And everything else is just kind of like a mirage. And we live in a world with a lot of mirages. And I'm not talking about a hotel in Las Vegas. Okay? You know, if we only had more money, if we only had more success, if we only had more applause, if we only had a fill in the blank, whatever it is in your life, then what, wow, we'd really come alive, wouldn't we? Now, this is not one of those, boy, I just wish I could go to church and sing more songs. It's not one of those moments, okay? This is reality. If you and I are cut off from the Spirit of God, it means that we will live a life of unsatisfied desire. We will live a life of spiritual dryness. We will live a life of emotional emptiness. We will live a life of moral failure and internal death. But it says there's a river. And a river runs through it. And as we saw, there's a river at the very beginning of the Bible. There's also a river at the very end of the Bible. Did you know this? Revelation chapter 22, verse 1. It says, then, then the angel showed me the river of the water of life. Pay attention to this description. This is something. Uh, showed me the river of the water of life as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. It's coming from the throne of God. I don't, I don't use your imagination. I don't get it. But it, it says that's, that's pure water, people. And that pure water is a symbol of when God has set everything right. It's also a reminder to us of the polluted world we live in right now. Revelation 22, verse 2, it says, It flows down the middle of the great street, of the city. What do we what do we talk about with streets in heaven? What, what what's what, what always they're made of gold, right? And we got water flowing down the center of that street. 
I remember what we read earlier in Psalms. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God. But look what it says after this. On each side of the river stood the tree of life. How does that happen? You have a tree and it's on both sides of the river. I don't know how that happens, okay? But on each side of the river stood the tree of life. That's the same one that we read about in the book of Genesis, okay? Bearing 12 crops of fruit. Anytime you have a 12 in a situation like this, that stands for the people of God. So that stream is for us. Yielding its fruit every month. This is a picture of the generosity of God. This is so much more than apples and pears, people. This is the gracious, giving grace of God. He gives far more than we could ever imagine. And it comes every month. And the people of God are going to do well. The next statement, though, is the one that moves me the most. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. Could the Middle East use a little healing right now? Could Ukraine use a little healing right now? Could Washington, D.C. use a little healing right now? Yeah. Could Union, Missouri use a little healing right now? What if God's plan is for his world to thrive? What if he plans for this world to do well because of us? So God sends his spirit. He sends his grace. He sends this river that goes to the tree of life, which means what? It means we are the leaves which are for the healing of the nations. It's not just about us. And it's not just for Union Mo, okay? It's not just for Franklin County. And it's not just about you. From Genesis to Revelation, from the moment we were born to the last breath we ever take, this is your life, and a river runs through it. Here is God, and here is grace, and every thought you have and every breath you take, every nerve ending that courses through your body, it's all grace. There is a river, and it's right here all of the time. Again, this is your life, and a river runs through it. God longs for our lives to do very well. He wants to do it for us more than we want him to. God wants us to reach our full potential more than we do. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nation. Anytime you see life thriving, okay, it's because it's receiving nourishment from somewhere beyond it. Tree doesn't produce its own water. Tree doesn't produce all of that. And what's true of a tree is also true of us. It's not our job to make ourselves thrive. We cannot make ourselves grow as much as we try. The most we can do for right now is to remove the barriers that keep growth from happening. By the way, that's where spiritual growth starts. And it's about way more than just adding a couple of spiritual exercises to your life, you know. Like, man, if I could just read 10 more minutes a day. If I could just go to church. If the preacher would just preach for a full hour. (laughs) Don't lie. (laughs) Don't lie. What I'm talking about is living deeply connected to God. I'm talking about actually waking up and functioning off of a source of fuel that is bigger than our own ideas or our own ability to manage anxiety. I'm talking about living, actually living with enough joy so that sin begins to look less tempting. Living with such energy that it looked less interesting. Living in such a way that we stop becoming so discouraged. Because we're not doing life on our own now. Now it's us and God. We're living in the flow of grace. And because of that, we don't have to pretend anymore. We don't have to manage what other people think of us because we can be honest about our own brokenness. That's one of the hallmarks of this church. You don't have to pretend when you come to this church because we don't have to fix it, okay? Because we are accepted. 
We don't have to be so afraid anymore. We can love, we can listen, we can confront, we can forgive. We don't have to worry about the outcomes of a whole lot of other stuff that everybody else is worrying about. And then on top of that, we have a sense of calling because all of this is never, ever just about us. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nation. So final question, what if God meant what he said? What if God meant what he said? What if God really is at work in this moment? What if the greatest thing that we could do is just jump in the river? I'm not suggesting that you go to Washington and jump in the river. Don't do that, okay? I'm not doing that. But the spirit of God is already at work here. And he is bigger and stronger and more patient than we are. And here's the thing. We don't have to be perfect. All we have to do is take one step closer. And if we take a step of obedience to tell a watching world that we stand with Jesus, for some of you, if you were to decide to be baptized today, God's pleasure and God's favor and God's love will not be contained and they will overflow you need to receive Jesus and you need to do that today. You can trust him. You can tell him that you're a sinner and you need him as your savior. And we're gonna give you that opportunity here this morning. As you look at your life, I love to ask people this question. As you look at your life, look back over your life. Has there been a point in time when you remember that you asked Jesus to save you? Because there should be, there should be that point in time. And again, this is not rocket science. This is something that every person can and needs to take care of. So I'm going to ask you to stand with me right now, please. I'm going to invite you to pray a prayer with me. In just a moment, I'll ask you if you're comfortable to bow your heads and close your eyes. This, there is nothing magic about the words of this prayer. This prayer is simply a means to connect with God. The scripture says it is by grace through faith that we are saved. It is not by our works. It is the gift of God. So today, if God is calling you, if he's saying, hey, it's, it's time, it's time for you to surrender, please open your heart because he's here. So if you would right now, bow your heads, close your eyes, and let's pray this prayer together. Repeat these words after me. Dear Jesus, come into my heart. Forgive me of my sin. Help me to live for you and to love you all the days of my life. Today I'm new. Today I'm changed. Today I'm forgiven. Today I'm free. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. All right, we're going to sing a song together. Don't you dare go anywhere because I've got instructions for you as soon as our song is over. Let's sing this together.